Hi, everybody. Welcome to Writing with Voice and Tone. I'm coming to you from the Pointer Institute. Uh, this is another, actually, this is the first in a series of writing webinars we'll be doing this year. And um, I'm Howard Finberg. I'm the Director of Interactive Learning at the Institute and the guy who uh, sort of oversees News University, which is our e-learning site for Pointer. And uh, we're glad to welcome so many newcomers to this event and uh, welcome to this very exciting series of webinars on the topic of writing. Before we get to the actual event, I need to thank the Harnish Foundation for funding our webinar equipment. That's what Studio H stands for, the Harnish people. And uh, Ruth Ann Harnish, we're, we're glad that you saw the need for uh, this kind of training and you supported us for that. Also, the Knight Foundation for its continuing support of Pointer is news you, and uh, we thank them for that as well. I know a number of you are going to ask other handouts, or there's going to be a, a copy of the slides. Uh, here's what we do at news you. We have a live event, and then within two days, often earlier, our intrepid producer, Jennifer Dronkers, will put up the replay for you to access anytime. So you'll be able to watch this webinar, um, stop, uh, go forward, uh, skip the good parts, skip the bad parts, whatever. It's yours. You'll find it in the My News You section of the tab. Brings me to our presenter for today, Kelly McGride, senior faculty member at the Pointer Institute. Um, when Kelly first came to Pointer, she was doing a lot of work in ethics, and now she's taken over the writing and reporting speciality at Pointer as well. And so she's a very versatile presenter and a terrific colleague, and we're glad to have her finally in the studio for her first um, this kind of webinar format, although Kelly was one of the very first people who ever did a webinar at Pointer. So we're glad to have you here, Kelly. Well, Welcome. Thank you for having me. And uh, before we get started, tell us a little bit of, of how this webinar series came about, because this really is your idea, isn't it? Well, um, you know, writing, reporting, and editing is one of our core curricular activities here at the Pointer Institute. And um, we wanted to make it available to um, people that can't necessarily get here on the ground and come to one of our seminars. So um, as I was looking at our curriculum, I was asking, what's the best way that we can make some of our great um, writing content available to, to people who, who otherwise wouldn't be able to get it? And we came up with this idea. You had something to do with that. Well, yeah, but I'm just the guy who's pushing the buttons to and answering the questions and the people in the, in the studio. So in any event, um, we're delighted we're going to be doing this. It's going to be 10 webinars. Uh, we'll tell you a little bit about the next one at the end of this event. And uh, But I'm most excited about what you're going to teach us today. So talk to us about what you want to lead us through. Well, um, one of the questions that um, writers struggle with, I think, all through their professional careers or amateur careers as well, um, is, is how do I achieve an appropriate voice in my writing? Um, when you look at really good writing, you can see that, that the author usually has a fairly well-developed voice and that that's one of the things that makes good writing good. But as a, but as a writer, it's, it's very elusive to figure out how to do that. And so um, today we are going to talk about what voice is and how you get there, how you develop your own voice. Now, can voice be used with any kind of story? Absolutely, with any kind of writing. Any kind it of writing. doesn't even need to be a story. Um, in fact, um, later in um, this hour, we will be looking at how writers use voice on Facebook and okay. on Twitter. And you've got some tips for us at the end, right? Absolutely. Something that you could do. All right. Well, yeah. I'll let you go to it. Okay. So, um, so, so like I said, um, writing with voice is, is an elusive, uh, at best, a very elusive um, uh, task as a writer. Um, but when you break it down and when you look at really good writing and you ask, how did this writer get to this point? How did they achieve this, this tone and this voice? Um, you will discover that writers um, make choices and that, that in order to achieve their voice, they... They, they have certain tactics and strategies. And so we're going to look at that. We're going to look at some blogging. Um, and we're going to look at how voice actually 
carries over time. So that as a writer, you don't necessarily change your voice with every new topic. Um, and, and I'll show you some examples of that. And then we'll also end up um, talking about institutional voice as well. Um, so first of all, a definition. What is voice? Um, writing voice is the distinct tone to writing that conveys the writer's perspective or personality. Now, that's a very vague definition intentionally. Um, and, and different experts will disagree over the, the exact definition of writing voice. But um, Di, Don Fry, um, who is a longtime friend of Pointer and um, Roy Peter Clark here at the Institute, um, quotes him in his book, Tools for Writers, voice is the sum of all strategies used by the author to create the illusion that the writer is speaking directly to the reader from the page. So, so that, by that definition, um, you can conclude that, that voice isn't one thing. And rather, it is an effect that happens when the writer uses other strategies. Um, so, so, so keep that in mind, because um, we're going to be talking about a lot of strategies that writers use. And those strategies are going to, um, sorry, little distraction there. Sorry about that. <laughs> Um, we just got moved around. <laughs> There's been an earthquake <laughs> yes, here in St. Petersburg. Petersburg. <laughs> um, so, so voice is not necessarily um, something that you set out to do. My writing will have this voice. But voice is the result of um, actions that you take. And, and we're going to talk about those actions as well as the result. So um, a, a, another um, um, fairly well-known writer, Grammar Girl, um, says, if voice is the personality of a story, then tone is the mood. And although lots of writers could describe their voice as funny, or, you know, and you could add in here sarcastic or dark or serious, the mood of their individual pieces um, is different. And that might be dark or biting or silly or sarcastic. Uh, so oftentimes, you will see the same writer use similar tactics, and you'll hear the same voice, but you'll recognize a completely different mood. Is there a difference between voice and tone and personality, or are, we, are those interchangeable things? Well, I, I don't think there's a formal difference, um, but, but voice is the illusion that comes um, with the writer. Personality, um, I, I think, can, can be applied to a piece as well as to a writer. So, All right, so why is it so elusive for vo writers to find their own voice? Um, I've read a lot of Annie Lamott, um, and, and I think she's a very talented writer. And she also teaches writing. And um, one, one of the things that she discourages writers from doing is, is attempting to appropriate another's voice as they try and develop their own. Now, we will talk about that tactic later in this session, because I don't discourage it as much as she does. Um, but it is something that comes with maturity as a writer. It's, it's not very often that you will find a young, inexperienced writer who has a natural voice. Um, most of the time, they have, they, you, you see hints at a natural voice, but, but it is something that comes with development and maturity. So how do you evolve your voice? You basically have two pathways. Um, you do it first as a reader, and you learn to recognize how other authors develop their own voices. And then finally, you do it as a writer. And as a writer, you have to get rid of your own bad habits first. And then you have to gather good material. You, you've, got to, you've got to essentially fertilize your work in order to, to create the environment in which your voice can grow. Um, and you do that by developing um, some fairly assertive writing strategies. And finally, the most important thing is to practice which we actually have more opportunity to do in this digital environment now than we ever did. Well, say a little bit more about that. Um, we are writing more than ever these days. Um, it's almost impossible to get by, get through life without writing. I mean, you're writing, if you're, if you're on an online dating site, you're writing your profile and you're interacting with people. I wouldn't know. Of course you wouldn't, but I would. Um, if you are, um, if, if you're on Facebook, Obviously, right. you're writing Your status updates. email. You're sending text messages to people constantly. In fact, teenagers today use their phones more to text than they do to speak on them. 
Um, so they are becoming, we, we, we have become a text-based culture. And that, that essentially means writing. Now, most of the time, we miss those opportunities. And sometimes they're just incomprehensible writings. Absolutely. But it doesn't have to be. So we'll talk about how you go from, from bad writing to good writing in, in the most informal, small environments. Um, so again, remember, voice is about choice. And it's about the choices that you make as a writer. Um, so when you read different writers, it's often columnists and opinion writers um, where it is most easy to spot their voice. So let's start with um, one of my favorites, Leonard Pitts, Jr. Um, this is an article that he wrote, um, a column that he wrote about the um, Olympic bomber um, who, was, who was arrested years after the 1996 bomber. Can you read this to us? Um, sure. I refuse to believe that most people who live south of Charles Mason and Jeremiah Dixon's line would find anything admirable in Rudolph. But many clearly do. They're careful to disavow the violence he's alleged to have visited upon his targets, the 1996 Olympics in Atlanta, a gay nightclub, an abortion clinic in the same town, another clinic in Birmingham. At the same time, they make clear that if Rudolph did it, they can surely understand why. Frank Holloway, a retiree, told the Washington Post, I wish they hadn't caught him. Look at those abortion doctors. They kill innocent babies. His wife, Linda, added, If he did that Olympic bombing, he should be punished. But as far as those abortion clinics and the gay club is concerned, he shouldn't be punished for that. You see, those things are not right in the sight of God. One wonders if she recognizes Osama bin Laden's reasoning coming out of her mouth. One doubts it. Religious fanatics are seldom perceptive of irony. Um, so, so here, especially in that last paragraph, you hear Pitts so clearly. And he often uses that, that device of one, the universal one. Um, and, and, and he uses it um, to create an illusion that you, the audience, share his point of view even though he recognizes that you don't. He does it because he thinks that you should. So that's one way that he uses, um, that, that, that's one device that he uses to create the voice in this piece. Um, if you notice, he starts with his own world, word, world view. He, the very first word out of, out of his mouth in that column is the word I. Um, and again, that's a, that is a strategy to say, here is where I'm coming from. It, it is, he roots that column in the first person, and then he switches to to the third person or one um, to to draw the audience in. Um, the other tactic that he uses in this particular column is when he refers to the Mason Dixon line. He deliberately forces you to acknowledge the historical context of that rather than just skimming over it. It's easy enough to say the Mason Dixon line, and that doesn't mean anything. But when he says Charles Mason and Jeremiah Dixon, he forces you to remember that there is a historical context to that line. And so in that one phrase, he gives you as much information as another writer might deliver in an entire paragraph. All of that works to help Pitts create his own voice and ultimately the tone of that piece. So let's look at another um, column by Pitts from that same year. Do you want to take a stab at reading this one? Well, I'll try. Okay. Mamie Till Mobley died in Chicago on Monday of an apparent heart attack. And if one were seeking to sum up her life, it might be enough to say that she spent 47 years keeping the casket open, speaking, writing, and agitating in the name of her murdered son. Indeed, her book, The Death of Innocence, is due for release this year. I met her once, maybe 30 years after her son's death, by which point she must have told his story a million times. And she still welled up as she spoke, her voice stammering and turning gray. And yeah, that last sentence. That's, that's a very powerful imagery of stammering and turning gray. Yeah, it conveys the emotion that he is seeking to achieve with this particular piece. Stammering and turning gray. He's, he's trying to tell you what happened um, to this woman in the wake of her son's murder. Um, and, and he does it in that very simple short sentence 
Um, and, and oftentimes you see that with voice. You see writers delivering information, 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 and then they slow down, they use fewer words, and they and they deliver very powerful imagery, and 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 he does that, but he does that with a with a specific purpose to achieve the emotional tone that he's trying to reach with this piece. Um, and again, you see him go back and forth from one to I. You know, um, if one were seeking to sum up her life, um, and then I met her once, he does that to draw the audience in. You're going to talk a little bit about the use of I later on, aren't you? I am. I am. Okay. Because I think it is easiest to achieve voice when you say I, but we don't all have the luxury of doing that. So we'll get to that. Um, another columnist that I want to look at is Connie Schultz from the Cleveland Plain Dealer. Yes. Friend of Pointer. You're going to read this one, aren't you? Because um, you have her voice down pretty well. Okay. I will read this one. Um, Later that day, well, actually, let me tell you what this story is about first. So Connie goes to a country club, and she discovers that the um, coat check girls do not get to keep the tips in the jar that is sitting out at the coat check, um, that actually management takes them and appropriates, th appropriates them for another purpose. Yeah, it's, yeah, so it's a great column subject in the first place. Later that day, later that same day, two vice presidents, Dave Grunenwald and Pat McKinley, called on speakerphone from Jacobs International Management Company, which owns Windows. We're confused, Grunenwald said. This is newsworthy? They were brimming with assurances. The, their 30 or so employees, some of the kindest, most professional servers I've encountered, are paid more than the minimum wage. How much more, they wouldn't say. The company matches any 401k contributions they can make, but offers no health insurance because they're all part-time. And they get a free meal. Quote, some places charge their employees for food, McKinley said. So, so in that very short passage right there, you see Schultz using her sources to achieve a tone, but not letting their tone control the, her decisions about the story. So she lets the sources hang themselves, but she paraphrases them in, in, in a very long sentence about 401k plans to, to make her point that um, these sources are defensive and um, insincere uh, and, and, and mainly just worried about their own reputation. And then she sort of delivers the final punch, and they get a free meal, quote, some places charge their employees. Um, she never has to tell you that she thinks these guys are jerks. Um, but you completely get that from her tone in her voice. Let's look at another piece that Connie wrote here. And this one, she takes a completely different approach. So you want me to read this one too? Sure. Okay, because I'm really good at this one. You, you like Connie. I do. See what happens when you tell a guy he can hide a gun under his sport coat? Right away, he starts strutting as if he were Matt Dillon kicking up dirt after a little coochie-coo with Miss Kitty. Threatening this, threatening that, it's embarrassing, really, especially when the fellow playing shoot 'em up is a state official. State Representative Jim um, Aslanades is just full of spit and swagger now that his concealed weapon bill has passed. Thanks to Cowboy Jim and his posse, your average citizen, not to mention your not-so-average raging ex-spouse and disgruntled employee, can carry a hidden weapon around any street in any state. Cowboy Jim was one of the first to take aim, firing away at any journalist armed with the silly notion that each and every resident in this fine state of Texas, I mean Ohio, has a right to know who's carrying a loaded weapon in their neighborhood. So she does a couple things here, including giving um, the state representative a nickname, Cowboy Jim, um, referring to the Wild West and using that imagery to convey her disdain, really, for this bill that passed in Ohio that allowed people um, to carry concealed weapons without um, the public knowing they had a concealed weapon permit. Um, and um, and she, this, is, this is written as almost a monologue or even a rant, um, which, is, which is absolutely her purpose. You should be able to read this out loud. Now, the trick is, is that Connie judiciously applies this tone. 
Because if she used it every time in every column, it would be really annoying. Yeah, that would probably get very tiresome after a while. Mm -hmm. And actually, for those of you who are on Twitter, you might notice that some writers who have really strong voices, um, you stop listening to them. Because if you sound like this all the time, um, if you can't moderate your voice, then, then you will lose your effectiveness. You want to be able to elevate the volume and lower the volume without changing the, the actual voice. In this case, she is shouting. She is, this, this is a, it's a rant. Speaking of Twitter, I just want to remind everybody that if you've got questions, you can send, send them to us via our hashtag NUWebinar, or if you want to ask Kella a question, use the little chat pod on the left-hand side of your screen. Yeah, and please ask me questions. I like questions. She's told me I have to interrupt her with questions. So while we, uh, we're going to ask you what you thought of that last Connie piece, Connie Schultz piece. So I'm going to put that up, a little poll question. To, and we'll take our first question from Nick, who says, how much personality is the right amount when writing factual-based piece, pieces with lots of numbers and analysis involved in the content? What, what do you have to say to Nick? Well, um, I, I, there, there is no formula for figuring that out at all. Um, but and, and that's actually where editors come in because because an editor will help you figure out how much personality is the right amount. I would say it's best to err on the side of too much personality and and ask your editor to pull you back. Um, or and, and if you don't have an editor, I was if say you, a lot of people don't have. You're editors. right, especially these days. Um, then you've got to find a trusted friend or a community to help give you honest feedback because when. <laughs> When, uh, one of the things I've noticed with writers is when I ask them to write with personality, they actually have a hard time doing it. And they, I, you know, they'll, they'll turn in a piece and I'll say, well, I thought we decided we were going to write this with a lot of personality. And they'll say, well, I did, didn't I? Um, you know, it's really hard to, you, you think you're being right. really funny or clever, but you're not. Well, I think the audience... Uh Today's event really thinks Connie is really pretty terrific. That yep, that works. Now I will say that um, there are some people who hate that column. You know, they think it's it it's an eye roller at best. So, um, so so when you move from columnists, where it's really easy to recognize their voice and to see the strategies and the choices that they're making. Um, if you move a little further down the continuum, I think that um, I have noticed that good bloggers use almost the same strategies as columnists. And here's one of my favorite bloggers. Um, Ta-Nehisi Coates writes for The Atlantic, um, and he writes a column on race. And um, this is a, a recent excerpt from him. It's really amazing how prejudice asserts, adjusts itself to the times. During the Civil War, blacks were thought to be not just lazy and cowardly, but actually physically weaker than whites. Indeed, up until the turn of the century, scientists were predicting that the frail and sickly black race would die out. Then Jack Johnson utterly destroyed Jim Jeffries, and the myth of the hyper-strong, ape-like black man was born, was born. Suddenly, whites couldn't compete because blacks were, quote, natural athletes who degraded contests of skill and technique with brute athleticism. It's lasted all the way up to Marlon Briscoe and Warren Moon. Somehow, prejudice finds a way until it doesn't. So, so um, Coates actually has a really sophisticated strategy in these two paragraphs. The first thing that he uses is cadence. Um, if you notice those first two paragraphs, the, the, the top of that second paragraph and the first paragraph mirror each other. Short sentence, long sentence, short sentence, long sentence. And then, so he repeats that a second time, and then he follows up with three quick, punchy sentences, each one tighter than the previous. And we'll go back and look at it. So, it's lasted all the way up to Marlon Briscoe and Warren Moon. Somehow, prejudice finds a way until it doesn't. Each one tighter, and, and that's his point. He wants you to focus on that. So he takes you through a very long historical period from the Civil War to um, the turn of the 20th century to the modern day NFL, and then, um, and then makes his point about um, prejudice and it, it 
eventually failing. Um, the other thing that he does is he uses the historical and cultural references the same way that Pitts used the reference to the Mason-Dixon line. Um, you may not necessarily know who Jim Jeffries is or who Warren Moon is, um, but eventually you will figure it out because you'll either go and find it. He recognizes that you're reading in an online environment, and in fact, it, most likely in the live version of this, there were links to this. Um, but even if you don't find it out, you know that there's something more to it. And then another way that he achieves his voice in this is he, he conveys his doubt by putting air quotes right. around. Or cynicism. Yes, exactly, around the words scientists and natural. So the thing about columnists as bloggers is they really do have it easy because they're expected to work from their own voice. And, and in fact, most people don't get to be a columnist until they have a well-developed voice. And most bloggers develop their voice pretty quickly. Um, if you have to work from a neutral point of view, you have to work harder to achieve voice. Now, one of the most successful writers in this respect is Lane DeGregory. Um, Lane works at the St. Pete Times um, and has, I followed her work for years. Um, and, and she she does, in terms of the range, she'll do very short stories and she'll do really long stories. But one of her most remarkable pieces was a piece called The Girl in the Window, um, for which she won a Pulitzer Prize. Here is a couple paragraphs, and I, this is going to go on for a couple of screens. Um, but but then we're going to digress and look at how she, how she achieves this. So follow along as Kelly reads this, because I think it's important to watch the way she constructs this. Yes. Of the story. Yeah, definitely. Tattered curtains, yellow with cigarette smoke, dangling from bent metal rods. Cardboard and old comforters stuffed into broken, grimy windows. Trash blanketing the stained couch, the sticky counters. The floor, walls, even the ceiling seemed to sway beneath legions of scuttling roaches. It sounded like you were walking on eggshells. You couldn't take a step without crunching German cockroaches, the detective said. They were in the lights, in the furniture, even inside the freezer. The freezer. While Holst looked around, a stout woman in a faded housecoat demanded to know what was going on. Yes, she lived there. Yes, those were her two sons in the living room. Her daughter? Well, yes, she had a daughter. The detective strove past her, down a narrow hall. He turned the handle on a door, which opened into a space the size of a walk-in closet. He squinted in the dark. At his feet, something stirred. First, he saw the girl's eyes, dark and wide, unfocused, unblinking. She wasn't looking at him so much as through him. She lay on a torn, moldy mattress on the floor. She was curled on her side, long legs tucked into her emaciated chest. Her ribs and collarbone jutted out. One skinny arm was slung over her face. Her black hair was matted, crawling with lice. Insect bites, rashes, and sores pocked her skin. Though she looked old enough to be in school, she was naked except for a swollen diaper. So this is all scene setting and description that Lane does here. But what works about it? Why is it so effective? And, and how does Lane achieve her specific tone and voice in this piece? Well, one thing she does is she uses cadence. She does a slow paragraph, a fast paragraph, and a slow paragraph. Another thing that she does is she mimics the cop speak in the retelling. Let me go back to it and show you here. Oops, sorry. Pardon me, I know this is this piece right here. Yes, she lived there. Yes, those were her two sons in the living room. Her daughter, well, she had a daughter. That's the way a cop would speak when he's telling that story for the tenth time, whether it's to a prosecutor or on a report. And Lane has done the reporting to, 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 to be able to use that with authority, even though she wasn't there when this happened. Um, in addition to that, um, Lane deliberately uses sentence fragments to convey that this information is important, but there is no context to put it in. Um, and then I want to 
point out two more things. One is she uses a fairly sophisticated alliteration, stained couch, sticky counters. Um, so she uses those literary devices that we learned about in elementary school. And she also, for the most part, recreates rather than quotes. And, and one of the differences between a writer with an immature voice and a writer with a developed voice is the developed writer will, will use her material to speak with authority, to say things because she is certain that they are true, because she's done the reporting, and then she'll figure out a way to source it, whereas the immature writer will, will rely heavily on sourcing directly within the story. So this is also from that same piece. And here's how you can see Lane's authority coming through here as well. This is about the couple who eventually adopted this child. Bernie and Diane are humble, unpretentious people who would rather picnic on their deck than eat out. They go to work, go to church, visit with their neighbors, walk their dogs. They don't travel or pursue exotic interests. A vacation for them is hanging out at home with the family. Shy and soft-spoken, they're slow to anger, and, they say, seldom argue. They had everything they ever wanted, they said, except for a daughter. Again, you see the, you see the sentence fragment at the end, except for a daughter, used for emphasis. When she does need attribution, she uses it twice. Um, they had everything they ever wanted, they said, and they are slow to anger, they say, seldom argue. She buries the attribution because that's the least important part of what she's of, saying. So it puts it in there but hides it so it doesn't break the rhythm of what she's writing. Exactly, exactly. And she, is, she has the confidence to say this with authority. And one of the things as a writer that you want to tell that you want to ask yourself is put away your notes and just ask yourself what can you say? What can you say with authority about the subject that you're writing with? That is one of the best strategies for achieving voice. Okay. Okay. So, she uses her observational reporting, um, attribution, we've talked about that. Again, she mimics the conversational style in this piece as well. So that was a really long piece, but Lane can also do that um, in a very funny short piece. So, so what I want you to notice with this is Lane uses the same exact strategies, but she achieves a completely different tone with this particular story. Um, do you want to try and read this, or you want me to read sure, it? Sure, I'll try. Okay. They sat on the grass in the front of a one-room schoolhouse, 23 third graders and a handful of chaperones. The girls wore sunbonnets and aprons. The boys were dressed in straw hats and knickers. They looked so innocent, like children of yore. Now, we're supposed to be back 100 years ago, their teacher told them. So remember your manners. Kids said, yes, ma'am, and no, sir, back then. They didn't speak unless they were spoken to. They raised their hands. She had brought her class to Heritage Village in Largo so they could learn about life a century ago. Then you head over to the field behind the log cabin, the teacher told them. Dylan's dad is going to show you how to hoe. A hush fell over the eight-year-olds. The children looked at each other. Some started to snicker. A blonde boy raised his hand. Excuse me, he asked. Isn't hoe a bad word? This boy had proven again that children today know too much. They've been exposed to things their great-great-grandparents never knew about when they were in the third grade. Clearly, the kids had no idea what a hoe was. Given the suburban neighborhoods where most of them lived, that wasn't surprising. But most of them, it seemed, had heard the slang word that sounds just like it. They might not have known what it meant, but they knew enough to know they shouldn't say that word. So why was their teacher talking about a hoe? And why was Dylan's dad going to show them how to do it? Oh no, the teacher said. I'm talking about a hoe. H-O-E. The children look confused. It's an old-fashioned tool people use to plow their land. The boy nodded, trying to process that explanation. Then his hand shot up again. So, he wanted to know, what's the hoe thing that's a bad word? The teacher shook her head and said the 
only thing she could. You better ask your mom. So what I love about that is that in addition to being really funny, you see her using the same strategies. Um, a couple of sentence fragments. Um, she uses her observational authority to, to provide more context. Um, you know, she tells you that these children are from the suburbs. Um, she, she tells you, you know, that, that right. um, all the things that, that, that you need to know. The bonnets, the sun, the sun mm -hmm. bonnets? Yeah, yeah. And, and, and she describes them raising their hands to ask questions. Um, so, so similar strategies, completely different tone in this story. Although I would argue that you could tell it's Lane to Gregory. It's still her voice. And so, so your, your voice, although it sounds the same, achieves a different tone with different subject material. Anne Hull is another really great observational reporter. Her editor, David Marinus, calls her the best observational reporter he's ever worked with. So Anne relies on two things in order to achieve her voice. Her skill at observation in order to set a vivid scene, and then she allows her own voice, I'm sorry, she allows her own authority to enhance that scene. And let me show you what I mean. This is from a piece she wrote in 2004 called Young and Gay in Real America. Michael Shackelford slides under his 1988 Chevy Cheyenne. Ratchet in hand, he peers into the truck's dark cavern, tapping his boot to Merle Haggard's silver wings drifting from the garage. Flat on his back, staring into the cylinders and bearings, Michael fixes his truck like he wishes he could fix himself. Michael is 17 and gay, though his mother still cries and asks, are you sure? He's pretty sure. It's just that he doesn't exactly know how to be gay in rural Oklahoma. He bought some share CDs. He tried a body spray at Walmart called Bod. He drove 22 miles to the Barnes & Noble in Tulsa, where the gay books are discreetly kept in the back of the store on a shelf labeled sociology. While the rest of the country is debating same-sex marriage, Michael's America is still dealing with the basics. There are no rainbow flags here, no openly gay teacher at the high school. There is just the wind knifing down the plains and people praying over their lunches in the yellow subway, in the yellow booths at Subway. Michael loves this place, but can it still be home? What if the preachers in the country music songs are right? So, and I, I think Anne is probably the most effective writer using this particular tactic um, that, that, that I personally read. So observational details, what kind of tool was he holding? He ratchet. was holding a ratchet. What was the song? Who was the artist? Right. You know, she strings together stuff that didn't happen all in the same afternoon. No. You know, he didn't drive to Walmart and to the Barnes and Noble. That, that is all something that she observed over time, but she can condense it and use those very specific details, but it is her authority that brings the voice of the piece out. Do the details bring the authority out? Well, the details give her the confidence to speak with authority. Ah. You can't challenge her because she has so many authentic details. Okay. So this is Anne, um, 2007, with the Walter Reed story. Now, um, it's harder with an investigative piece to achieve voice. It's easier with a, with a feature or a traditional sort of, um, well, investigations tend to have more facts and figures. But Anne brought those same observational strategies to this investigative piece, and, and it has the same effect. Family members who speak only Spanish have had to rely on Salvadoran housekeepers, a Cuban bus driver, the Panamanian bartender, and a Mexican floor cleaner for help. Walter Reed maintains a list of bilingual staffers, but they are rarely called on, according to soldiers and families at, and Walter Reed staff members. Um, Evis Morales, severely wounded son, was transferred to the National Naval Medical Center in Bethesda for surgery shortly after she arrived at Walter Reed. She had checked into her government-paid room on post, but she slept in the lobby of the Bethesda Hospital for two weeks because no one told her there is a free shuttle between the two facilities. They just let me off the bus and said, bye-bye, recalled Morales, a Puerto Rico resident. 
So again, this is a piece where they're documenting failures. Um, and this is one failure among dozens and dozens that they documented in this piece. And it's a fairly minor one. The fact that, that, that the hospital has the ability to do translation, but it never actually provides those services because of um, disorganization. Now, one of the things that I've noticed is that true voice carries over time. Um, we've, we've looked at a couple pieces by writers that were written within a couple of years, but um, I was recently reading Joan Didion. Um, and, and Joan is a great writer, has been writing for decades. Um, in, in, in way back in 1968, when she wrote Slouching Toward Bethlehem, this is how it opens. The center was not holding. It was a country of bankruptcy notices and public auction announcements and commonplace reports of casual killings and misplaced children and abandoned homes and vandals who misspelled even the four-letter words they scrawled. So almost 40 years ago, she wrote that. And then, um, more recently, um, when her husband died, um, in the year of magical thinking, she wrote, in the midst of life, we are in death, the Episcopalians say at the graveside. Later, I realized, I must have repeated the details of what happened to everyone who came to, those ho to the house in those first weeks. All those friends and relatives who brought the food and made the drinks and laid out the plates on the dining room table for however many people were around at lunch or dinner time, all those who picked up the plates and froze the leftovers and ran the dishwasher and filled our, I could not yet think my, otherwise empty house even after I had gone into the bedroom, our bedroom, the one in which there still lay on the sofa a faded terry cloth extra large robe bought in the 1970s at Richard Carroll in Beverly Hills, and shut the door. So 40 years apart, but you can still hear the same strategies. The run-on sentence in this case is used to create the illusion of chaos. And, and, and very different kind of chaos, but, but still the same chaos. She also uses a reference to an outside literary document. What's the value of that, Kelly? Well, I think it acknowledges a broader context or a broader place for this piece of writing. The, 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 the work can stand on its own, but it right. connects it to a universal body of work. That people may know, have mm -hmm. more personal connection to? Certain people in the audience, yes, have, have a, definitely a personal connection to mm. it. But even if you don't, it's sort of like an invisible thread that, that connects you to, to the rest of the world. Well, Joan Didion is probably a good, a good place to ask this question by Michael. Do you have any advice about writing descriptively without being too wordy? <laughs> well, I would say um, that's where editing comes in, and especially self-editing. A lot of times, if you're going to write descriptively, your first draft is going to have too many words. And part of what you need to do is then go back and figure out which words are really important and which words you can get rid of. Um, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about the strategy of matching the right descriptive details um, to the tone of a piece okay. through using your voice. Thank you, Michael, for that question. Uh, talk a little bit about the juxtaposition. That was fascinating. Yeah, this is another strategy that um, Joan Didion uses. So you see it in both places here. Um, in, in the first piece, Slouching Toward Bethlehem, Casual Killings and Misplaced Children. Um, two completely different things, but when you put them next to each other, it's disturbing. Picked up the plates and froze the leftovers. Um, again, related but different. And, and they, create, um, they create a sense that these things don't go together. So one of the things that we would like to um, hear from you guys is what writers and what techniques do you admire? So if you want to, um, in the little box there, let us know. Um, we'll share those with the rest of the group at the end of the... Well, actually, uh, before you put it in the little box on the left, what? we're going we're to do that at the end when we go to questions. We're going to have a chat area for participants of this webinar. So start thinking about who, what writers that you uh, admire and what techniques. So just hold on to those. But if you've got specific questions for Kelly, then use the box on the left. 
Oh, sorry about that. Yeah, sorry. My bad. No, you're not that bad. Okay. Um, one more writer to look at before we get into um, some of some of the strategies that we use as writers. Um, Nathaniel Rich um, writes for Rolling Stone, and um, he did a profile on Stieg Larsson um, just last month. And for those two or three people who might not know who Stieg Larsson is? Um, the Girl with the Dragon Tattoo two, Trilogy. Right, yes. exactly. All right. Um, so, so in um, it, setting the scene, it is a gray building on a gray side street in a gray part of Stockholm. That's why Stieg Larsson chose it. What works? The repetition, obviously. Gray, gray, gray. 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 Yeah, that's um, very deliberate, though. Um, you don't do that by accident. When you repeat words by accident, you merely sound repetitive. But when you choose to repeat them for effect, you achieve a level of voice. Do you think this can be overdone, this use of repetition? It can be, but a lot of times, um, I mean, if, you, if you're doing it deliberately, for the most part, it, it, it's, it's to achieve a certain effect. effect. So even if you do it over and over in a piece, um, if you can articulate why you're doing it, I'm going to guess that it's most likely going to work. But if you can't articulate why you're doing the repetition, then you probably don't have a good reason to be doing it. So he wrote this part as well. Yes. Um, in the U.S., the trilogy sold more than 13 million copies this year alone, roughly equal to the sales of recent books by John Grisham, Dan Brown, Stephanie Meyer, and Stephen King combined. Larson has outsold Paddington Bear, Anne Frank, and Roger's Thesaurus. Now, this is good. I like this. I like those three last references. Paddington, Paddington Bear, Bear, Anne Frank, and, and Roger's Thesaurus. Thesaurus. That's interesting. But one of the things that you want to do, um, so, so he, he did that to sort of show you the broad range right. of, of of things that 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 Larson has outsold, but but one of the things that you want to do is maybe play around with other authors' writing to see if you can make it better. So, it's a surprise when you see that pa Paddington Bear and Anne Frank. Although if he'd written it a little differently, it would have a different effect. Um, he could have said, Larson has outsold Anne Frank, Roger's Thesaurus, and Paddington Bear. And by putting Paddington Bear at the end of that sentence, um, you, you create more of a whimsical tone to the piece. Or he could have written, L Larson has outsold Paddington Bear, Roger's Thesaurus, and Anne Frank. I think I prefer Paddington Bear at the end. Do you? See, I like Anne Frank at the end because, especially because you're talking about the, the girl with the dragon tattoo, um, you're talking about a young woman who survived harsh circumstances. So when you throw Anne Frank in, you sort of connect those two without actually being over the top with it. But in typical pointer fashion, there's no right answer? There is no right answer, um, but some strategies are more effective than others. Right. You know, and one of our uh, participants uh, pointed out something we talked about during our rehearsal uh, was that Perhaps the use of the Roger's Thesaurus was not a good, yeah, a good book to use because it's it's a reference book. It's not a it's not a book you'd buy for for pleasure. Yes, and and actually it becomes a stumbling block in this right. piece um, because so, it's a possessive as well as a hard to get your head around thesaurus as a word anyhow. Yes, words that are hard to say out loud are generally hard to read as well. Well, kudos and a hat, and the tip of the hat to Elaine for reminding us that we wanted to address that issue. Good point, because we actually had said that during the rehearsal. So, now, once you get um, fairly skilled at reading other writers and figuring out the strategies that they use, one of the things that you want to do is to look at your own writing and figure out what you did in the past that failed and how you can improve it. And so in order to do that, we're going to actually look at some sentences that I wrote and published. You will find these on Pointer <laughs> Online, um, and that's because if I'm going to criticize other people's writing, I should criticize my own as well. So recently I wrote this sentence. Journalism is a profession rife with stars who get away with a lot. Now, the subject in that sentence is journalism, and the verb is is. Journalism is an okay subject. Is is a horrible, horrible verb. And as a rewrite... So, and this took me less than 15 seconds, I think. 
As a rewrite, I tried this. Journalism stars populate the choice cubicles in every newsroom. Better. Much better. Yeah. Because it's because it evokes a sense of these bright lights. Mm-hmm. I found a much better verb, populate. Yeah. Um, stars is an even better noun than journalism, and I made journalism the modifier. Um, so in doing that, and, and when you look at your own writing, the easiest way to do this is to just look at your subjects and your verbs and to see if those are the best subjects and verbs to convey what you're trying to say. Um, so here's another one, and, and I, this is a recent sentence for me as well. But when satire goes beyond its intended audience, it often becomes offensive. So the subject is satire, the verb is goes, and then the second subject is it, and the second verb is becomes. That second subject and verb are horrible, <laughs> almost embarrassing. I want to know where my editor was. Let me get away with that. So when I rewrote it, but when satire migrates beyond its intended audience, the material evolves into offensive. Again, just looking for better verbs often will be enough to change your sentences into, into ones that have much more voice. Voice, yeah. I, and, you come, and you write with a voice. You know, I do, because I have this voice of, of authority and exploration, because I write about ethics. Um, so, so I recognize that I have a voice, um, but sometimes you don't achieve it, or you just don't achieve it well enough. Um, a guy who does this really well, I think, who, who, has, who usually chooses really good verbs is David Gonzalez of the New York Times. Right. So he wrote this great piece about Pentecostalism in New York. Um, and in there, um, th this is just a couple paragraphs. Um, so his father, Francisco, he said, insults the ark, insults, calling it a scam to fleece them of what little money they have. Fleece is also a good verb there. A rough-looking man, Francisco Laura, is the only family member who has not converted to Pentecostalism. He scorns the congregation's belief that their prayers kept his wife alive through years of surgery and chemotherapy, and he scoffs at his son Jose's conversion in prison last year. Um, those two verbs are great verbs in and of themselves, but together they work in tandem to, to create a true tone to this piece. Um, and, and David does it um, simply by you, getting the best you verbs. You often don't see scorns and scoffs in, uh, in everyday writing. No, because they're so short. They're such short verbs that I think most people would overlook them. But they're very good. Well, Nick's question is, is there a danger of slowing down the readability when you try to get too crafty with verbiage? Yes, especially if you overly complicate your sentences. So as you get crafty, one of the things that you want to do is keep your subjects and your verb as close together as possible. Okay. Before you go on, Kelly, I just want to remind everybody that this is what we call a more robust webinar. Um, it was, uh, it's always been scheduled for 75 minutes, where, so don't worry if you're coming to the top of the hour and you have to go someplace. You'll still be able to get the replay, but we've got a lot more. Uh, we've got tips for you. so. That's why we wanted to extend this in, uh, into a, as, as the dean of faculty calls it, a more muscular webinar. So, yeah. Wait, you got to see my gun. Yeah. There you go. Okay. <laughs> All right. Okay. So, um, and, and, and if you guys want to take some of your sentences and rewrite them um, and share them um, with me, then um, we'll figure out a way to um, call the best of them and, and bring them back to you in a webinar later this year somehow. That's a great idea. I like that. Okay, so tip number one, and we talked about this earlier, try imitating a well-known writer's style. Um, I've seen a lot of reporters do this um, on Dr. Seuss's birthday, um, but you can do it with Amy Tan, you can do it with Maya Angelou. Just do it for a paragraph or two, just to, just to learn a little more about how, they, how that writer is making his or her choices, and then throw it away, because if you don't do that, you'll piss off Anne Lamott. Um, <laughs> but we don't want that. <laughs> right. You know, so she, she says every time Isabel, and I think you say Allende. it, Allende, yeah. Isabel Allende has a new book out. I'm happy because I get to read it, and I'm unhappy because my students are going to start writing like her, and their renditions never ring true. Um, Anne will tell you 
um, that if you're really going to develop your own voice, you have to find good material. And the best place to find that material is in your own experiences. Um, so, and, and, and I actually think that's true, too. Um, underdeveloped voices need fertile ground. And, and that means you need a lot of rich information. So what better to write about than your own personal experiences? So this is what Anne says about writing. Um, the truth of your experience can only come through in your own voice. So once you get the, get the hang of it with your own experiences, you can go on and, um, and, and apply that style to other types of writing. So tip number two from William Zinser, throw away your first three or four paragraphs. Um, it just takes a while to settle in as a writer. So don't, um, d don't hang on to those first couple graphs. Um, gathering the right material is really important. And we've talked about this, details and imagery. Um, and then what's really important is once you've gathered all that material, you've got to match the material to the emotion you want to convey. So rather than imitating your subjects, and I see a lot of sources do this, incorporate their language into your writing voice. What's the difference between imitation and incorporation? Well, imitation would be merely, think about like if you're writing about a rap artist. Yes. And you would simply imitate what they're doing. Right. Rather than incorporating, so, so, so if you're incorporating that into your work, you might choose um, a simple verb or, or a phrase, and you might bring that into a broader sentence. So, so part of the sentence would be your words, and then the rest of the sentence would be their words, and together you would achieve that ever-elusive voice. So you can see Tanahishi did this um, in this piece that we looked at already. These words that he used, lazy and cowardly, not his words, but he uses them to great effect. Same with the word ape-like. Um, Lane de Gregory did this um, in terms of the cop speak. You know, yes, she lived there. Yes, those were her two sons in the living room. Her daughter, well, she had a daughter. This is an interview that she's doing with somebody. It almost sounds a little bit like Jack Webb and Dragnet in terms of the st 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 staccato. It's a staccato. Thank yep. you. Yeah. Okay. So find the emotion. Remember what uh, Al Tompkins always says: people remember what they feel, not what they know. And so you've got to ask yourself before you sit down, what is the emotion? If you look at those two Lane DeGregory pieces, in one, the emotion was outrage. And in the other, it was humor, or maybe even nostalgia. Um, but she picked very specific words to, to convey that and details. So William Zinser says that even if you can't use the word I, pretend you can, Write out the first draft with the eyes in it and then take it out. It'll warm up your style. That's an interesting technique. So just write it as if you were writing first person mm -hmm. and then go back and rewrite it. Yeah, yeah. Then go back. And, and, and what that does is it allows you to sit down and say, okay, here is what I can say with authority. Okay, finally, um, you have to practice. And we have so many opportunities to practice, from Facebook to Twitter to email and notes to your family. So this was me practicing. Um, email I sent to a friend of mine just recently. Man, I wouldn't be a teenager again if you paid me. They have all the destructive emotion, emotional capacity of a spurned lover and none of the brain development to wield that power with any responsibility. And we, if you know Kelly, that's your <laughs> voice right there. And we were talking about daughters and raising daughters. Um, so that was me, and I was being very deliberate, especially with that word spurned lover. Um, Ellen Angelotti recently, and this is a retweet, but it achieves voice. Oregon Trail is now on Facebook. Your workplace productivity just died of dysentery. Now that's a little insider for people who know the game on Facebook. Yeah, but who doesn't know the game? Well, Oregon Trail is like from our childhood. That's your childhood. Yeah, perhaps. it was meant for a very specific audience. Yeah. Definitely. Um, David Hanshu, breaking news, Groundhog just found shot to death after prediction is six more weeks of winter. Lots and lots of suspects. David's a real hammy kind of guy. You can hear his voice in that. This is a teenager. Insert complaint about this month being busy, which I think is a fairly sophisticated form of humor as well. 
Um, but fits, this is a very dry, um, sort of right. straightforward teenager. So, so you suggest that look at every form of your writing, every mm -hmm. delivery device that you use to write, and practice across all those platforms. Absolutely. So don't look at Twitter as being something over here or Facebook something over there. Yeah. But use every one of these platforms to practice voice. And if you go back over your old Facebook posts, you might even be able to discover your best expression of your own personal writing voice that you didn't even know existed. So, um, Sean Daly. Sean Daly's a writer at the St. Pete Times, and Sean's voice is the voice of a little boy looking at a pinup girl. Um, so recently, um, he posted on Facebook, because you secretly care, and then he linked to the new Britney Spears album coming out. And, and what's also funny in this is if you look at that second reply, Mark Seaman, a new Britney album, that's the hottest news in 1998. I'll log on to CompuServe and tell all my friends. You know, CompuServe. Yeah. The great word in that because it, because it. It's evocative. Of retro. Yep. Yes. Here's another Sean Daly one. Sex, mystery, parade floats. It's like Girls Gone Wild, 1950s edition. Now, he's actually retweeting an article. Did he write the article? He wrote the article. So he then took his article and, and tweeted mm -hmm. this reference to it. Mm-hmm. And why don't you go to the article? Yeah. Well, the two of them work in tandem because here's the lead to that story that he wrote. For those ten years, all eyes were on her, the vavoomish gamine made of curves and question marks. Her flashbulb smile popped with Hollywood sheen, but her legend was pure, pulpy sunshine state. Notice those great subject verbs. Flashbulb smile popped. She was the makeshift Gasparilla goddess who one day playfully crashed the famous parade and the next day woke up a folk hero. Newspapers dubbed her the Mystery Blonde, and from 1950 to 1960, they devoted buckets of winky ink to the girl who appeared out of nowhere, and then appeared everywhere, parades, runaway, runways, daydreams. She didn't stay a mystery for long, as any B-movie gumshoe could tell you, mischievous blondes usually don't. There was a husband and a swinging supper club and the ivory-pure backstory of an innocent from the Midwest, which she was. Well, so, and he's over the top in this yes. particular piece, um, but he does that on purpose. Well, the subject was sort of over the top. Exactly. You read more of the story that this is a woman who claimed to fame as just being over the top. Yes. Yeah. So, um, let, me, let me do just two more things. One is, even institutions develop voice, and if you look at Slate magazine here in their tweets, they have a really good institutional voice. Um, it's always got a bit of humor to it and a bit of we're not the Washington Post, which is, which is what their voice right. is. Um, and then, finally, even when the situation is very grave, even when it's very serious, um, the reader's voice is what makes it human and allows it to connect to the, allows, I'm sorry, the writer's voice is, a, is what makes it human and allows the reader to connect with it. And here's a tweet recently. Am okay, lousy at throwing rocks, but did my part anyway. I doubt I threw a single one that landed in Target. No injuries so far. This is out of Egypt. Yep, this is from Cairo. Um, so, so that's an example of where this, you know, there, there's really not much information here, but the voice of the writer is so compelling. Um, and the experience that he's sharing is so compelling that um, um, nobody else could have said this. All right, final tip. Tip number four. A good one. Read your work out loud. Um, the most powerful way to test the authenticity of your voice, your writing voice, is to use your real voice. And, of course, that comes from my very good colleague, Roy Peter Clark. Right. And uh, who happens to be sitting in the webinar studio right now and remarkably raving very quiet. <laughs> <laughs> He's behaving himself. So, Kelly, that was that was truly wonderful. That was a great way of looking at voice and tone. It was, it, it, and, you know, and as you're talking about that last tip, it reminded me why we read things out loud when we teach at Pointer. Mm -hmm. Because you do pick up that tone, that voice, as you listen to, to your own story. So that is a great tip from Roy. 
Uh, we're going to go to questions, and we've got three or four of them all lined up in just a second. Before we do that, I have to remind you this is part of the webinar series on writing that the Pointer Institute is hosting this year. Next, March 9th, um, short narrative first. Who's going to do this one? That's David Folkenflick from oh. National Public Radio. Radio. Yes, and, uh, and he's all excited about doing that. So we're looking forward to having David at the webinar studio. We have got a seminar, Teaching the Craft of Writing, for our educators. Um, and that deadline is coming up in April, so we want to call that attention to you. How could I not promote our big <laughs> webinar, Wallapalooza, <laughs> next week? Finally, at long last, it's here. The Pointer Out of Body Experience. It is. Um, we're going to celebrate our 100th webinar next week. And uh, that's a promotion code. If you haven't signed up for it, uh, write that down. It expires on Monday so that you can pay $10 to get 100 ideas to make your journalism better within 100 minutes. It's uh, Whether we do it in 100 minutes is the biggest challenge I have, but <laughs> I, I have hopes. I have hopes. Next Wednesday at 2 p.m. is uh, when we're doing our 100th webinar. Same bat time. Same, same bat channel. channel. Uh, we have an online group seminar um, by our friend Michael Schwartz. Uh, he's actually doing this session right now. He's going to do another one. Uh, in June, and we really highly recommend this if you're having problems getting your information organized, getting some clarity on your writing. With that, uh, commercial messages are over. Let's go to the questions. And we change the pod. In the middle, right underneath our uh, lovely pictures, uh, you can start a conversation with your colleagues in the, uh, in the, in the webinar, uh, or you, on the right-hand side, you can ask us additional questions. So I'm going to go to Kate's question, she does all of her interviews over the phone. Are there good leading questions to elicit details when you're not there to see, smell, hear for yourself? Great question. Yes, there are. And I would say don't ask leading questions. <laughs> um, ask open-ended questions for which you do not know the answer. So, um, you know, rather than saying, you know, when you picked up the boys from soccer practice, did you, you know, did your car stink? Say, what does it smell like with four sweaty soccer boys in your car? Right. Um, ask those open-ended questions. Ask people to describe for you what they saw or what they smelled, what they heard. Um, so, so a lot of times, especially if you're doing your interviews over the phone, but you want to get some narrative details, um, you have to ask your sources to slow down and describe um, what they saw and experienced. And for some people, that's really hard to do. It, it requires a certain amount of listening and not interrupting. And let people silence works during an interview, right? Absolutely, absolutely. So do yes, shut up. And especially when they <laughs> when they stumble over something and you hear a piece of silence. A lot of times our inclination is to fill in the blanks for them, but if you can just train yourself to be quiet, you'll get some, you'll get much better details from, from your sources. Let's go to Sarah's question. At her TV station, we're basically throwing reporters in the deep end of social media, expecting them to maintain Facebook fan pages and Twitter accounts and, yes, even blogs, with little guidance on writing style. Right. Do you have any specific resources that I can recommend to them? She's the web content manager. Yes, and actually, so I should take my writing hat off and put my ethics hat on. Well, yes. Because this is more of an ethics question. But no, actually, um, all decisions are ethical decisions that we make in journalism. So um, yes, um, we have um, on pointer.org, um, we have a, um, a guide to using social media, a, a, right. prescri a, a suggested policy that you can use. Um, and um, if you search for um, if you search for social media policy, I believe you'll get that on pointer.org. If you have trouble finding it, contact us and we'll get it to you. All right. Well, what about people? Where where should you go for resources other than this webinar series? Uh, well, David Folkenflik. And, and I think David next month will be talking specifically <laughs> about some challenges that you're looking for. But I'll also say that a good rule of thumb is that you should not ever publish something on a social media site that you wouldn't publish in your traditional media, uh, outlet. media outlet. So, I mean, you could see that um, Sean Daly's um, status update on f Facebook was, was in character with the story that he was publishing. Um, so so that's, a, that's a good rule of thumb for people who are struggling 
um, with, with how to be appropriate and still have a personality in social in a social media context. Okay. Well, let's go to Tanya's question. How can we balance digital writers' voices with the overall voice of a publication? Ooh, that's a good, that's a meaty one. That is a meaty one. And in fact, I think a lot of publications are struggling with this right now. Um, at a certain point, um, someone in the organization, a manager, is going to have to decide whose voice takes precedent. Um, and, and oftentimes we don't decide this until we're ready to fire the person. Um, but, um, you know, a lot of times you, I believe that the individual voice is becoming more and more valuable. Right. Um, it, you know, we want to hear personality and, and we want to hear perspective. Um, but the institutional voice is, is at times going to say no that can't happen. And I think one of the places that you saw that happen, and I've, I've written this and said this out loud, so I don't mind saying it in this forum, is in the conflict between Juan Williams and National Public Radio. That was very much about Juan's voice right. not, being, um, not being compatible with NPR's voice. Um, so I don't think there's an easy way to answer that, especially in the time that we have left. Um, but, but that's a leadership and a management issue. Okay. Um, so here's BJ's question. Um, those that are great sources, he, he or she writes, and even an inexperienced writer may know if they want to include sources info like that, but how does an amateur writer gather or get access to information? I'm not exactly sure what BJ is referring to, but well, I think the, the, the more meat of the question is, how does an amateur get better at doing what the, what, what you're talking about? Well, an amateur might not have the opportunity to go out and write a an investigative story on Walter Reed Medical Center. Right. But an amateur can you can tell the story of your kid's first day at kindergarten, or you can tell the story of um, your own um, you know horrible very bad day as a child, or um, you know, your failed marriage or whatever it is. You can, so, so I think that amateurs most often develop their voices by starting with the very, very personal essay type writing. So it's amateur in the sense of not being paid professionally, but not mm -hmm. necessarily amateurist in their writing. Exactly, yes. Yeah. Um, Kelly, we've got a couple more minutes, and uh, what, what other things, advice that you would recommend um, folks to think about in terms of improving their writing over the course of this coming year. The, this is the year of writing. for The year of writing. It's the year of the rabbit, right? Yes. The whiting rabbit. Whiting um, rabbit. <laughs> we need a little mascot, I think. I don't think so. <laughs> I'm getting one. Um, find a community. Find a community of writers who can offer you honest feedback. Um, in the professional world, we call these newsrooms. Um, for the most part, and they are getting smaller and smaller, and, and many more of us are writing in isolation now compared to what we used to. Also, just the rhythm of the work in the professional world has changed so much. Right. You don't have that reflective time anymore, so you yeah. have to find the way that you can work on your writing. Yeah, and so, so, so oftentimes finding a community, finding a good, safe editor is, I, I cannot say enough for, um, for, for that type of relationship. Um, I've been blessed as a writer to have some very, very good, helpful editors. Um, and having somebody that you can trust to pull you back when you've gone too far and to push you out there when you're not going far enough is, is really important. And if you're not a professional, that means that you've got to tap a friend. Um, but, but having somebody who can play that role with you is pretty important, too. Well, that's great advice to end um, this first webinar in our Pointer Writing webinar series. Kelly, thanks for kicking this off. Uh, we're right at the 75 minute mark and yeah, yes, <laughs> I know you were aiming to be right on time. And uh, But more important is the quality of what you presented. You gave us all lots of things to think about, some practical tips, and we really appreciate you developing this material and guiding this webinar series this is going to be a fun ride for the year, and just remember, you'll be able to watch this webinar again and a replay in, uh, within two business days. If you haven't had a chance to tell us your reaction to this webinar, we always do a little poll at the end, so 
It's very important as we try to figure out what's working and what doesn't work. We hope to see you next week at the 100th webinar celebration at Pointer. We've got 18 presenters, more than 100 ideas to make your journalism better. We hope that you'll come and hang out with us for 100 minutes. Signing off from Studio H at the Pointer Institute, I'm Howard Finberg. I'm delighted that you uh, had a chance to spend some time with us today. Have a great morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you are in the world, and never stop learning.